Charizard. Now I could probably just stop right there and just begin the video because we all know why we're here. This Pokemon has been popular and very relevant ever since it was one of the OG box art Pokemon. Starting with the first edition base set card that could probably just buy you an entire house if you had one in good enough condition, all the way to getting two different mega evolutions in X and Y, and then being Leon's ace in Pokemon Sword and Shield, it's just very clear that Charizard's popularity has not gone down at all. Now as for me, my first Pokemon game was Pokemon Red back in the 5th grade, and yes, I did almost exclusively use Charmander during my first playthrough. I was definitely in that category of players that over leveled their starter and had like a level 75 Charizard while my second best Pokemon was like 30 levels lower. We've all been there, don't judge me. So for today, I'm actually pretty excited to do the best I can with this run. In Red and Blue, I do think there's a lot of potential. But I will go ahead and say that if this was yellow version, there'd be a lot more problems, and we'll talk about that later, but I do think that we can squeeze out a high quality run today. But before we begin, I'd like to quickly say that I do solo run content often, mainly focused on Generation 1, and if that sounds like something you might be interested in, consider subscribing to be kept up to date. Now if you enjoy the content, it's the likes and the comments that really help small channels grow, so if you want to help me out, whether you are a returning subscriber like Jay. WJ, maybe you're somebody new, maybe you're someone who never thinks about that sort of thing, or maybe you're just a little shy. Well, I got you. Just scroll down and type in just a lizard because Charizard is definitely not a dragon type. I'd also like to say that I have heard the feedback on my overlay, and I do have a few things that I need to fix, but I am backlogged on actual footage, so the videos I'm making now, it's gonna be a couple of weeks before you see those fixes, but I do listen to you guys. I want you guys to sit back, I want you to relax, grab yourself a nice soda pop, and let's see how our little fire lizard can do. Right from the start, I set Charizard in place of Charmander via the Universal Pokemon Randomizer, and for this run, the name will be Komodo because just like the Komodo Dragon in real life, it's also just a lizard and not a dragon type, despite the misleading signs. Now we've done several fire type runs to this point, and if you followed the channel, then you know the typical pitfalls for them, but as far as the early game goes, you could easily do minimum battles up to Brock, but similar to the horsey run, you would just be setting yourself up for a harder time later. Now I don't take on the optional rival, but I do make sure to face all the bug catchers in Viridian. With Ember, you can make really short work of them, and it's about the easiest experience that you'll get as well as being very efficient. I also take on the Light Years Junior Trainer as well because he only uses ground types and they don't resist fire. From there, I can quickly move on to Brock at a clean level 12, and with high speed and a special attacking move, I can make short work of him. It's worth reiterating from other runs that you'd think fire would be really bad here because rock type resist it, but their special stat is low enough to where you actually do a lot of damage here. You have growl for onyx's bide turns, but it turns out to not really matter in this case, and this one is more or less just a speed bump as we prepare for the tough roadblocks ahead. Going towards Mount Moon, the plethora of bug types means that Ember will be just feasting tonight as we go through these battles very fast and very efficiently. Now outside of very few exceptions like the last with the two grass types. I don't do too much extra here, but I do pick up Mega Punch because Ember just isn't a move that's going to solve some of the problematic parts of the run. Now if you're just following along at home, just don't get rid of Leer. It's key to lessen the load coming up. You need it. It's crucial. At level 19, Misty's just off the table. Don't even try it. And rival number 2 is up next by default. Mega Punch isn't the most reliable move, but with higher base damage and the the fact we have higher attack means that I'm going to be utilizing it a lot here. Pidgeotto goes down in two mega punches and I avoid sand attack and the rest of the battle just flows really smooth. Also I guess this is kind of a weird spot to mention this but I am using the visual patch 
that uses the Pokemon Yellow Sprites, which are my favorite out of basically all the games, in case you're wondering uh, what's going on here. The route to Bill's house is very easy, and I guess this is as good of a time as any to say that this isn't my first run. This is the run where I made all the adjustments, and originally I was battling a lot more trainers pre-Cerulean and on this route, but to give Charizard its best chance on the tier list, I did cut most of them out, and we can just go ahead and kind of talk about why. A lot of fire types just have to straight up skip Misty because Starmie is really oppressive. In my initial testing, level 25 or 26 seemed like a pretty solid level, but even further refinement led me to level 24. As far as Staryu goes, one Leer into a Mega Punch can take it out. Two Mega Punches would do the same job, but since it has lower accuracy, this is a safer play. Now as for Starmie, it can get X defend, and using Leer is kind of hit or miss. Now I do spend a lot of resets in my test runs I used Leer pretty much every time but for this run for whatever reason I decide that I'm just gonna go straight Mega Punch and the Poke Gods grant me some crits and it doesn't let Starmie use Bubble Beam back on me and I actually make it through this one on the first shot with no resets and it's pretty clean this was one of the few spots in my practicing that I had to route to actually solve this problem and the fact that I got past it with no resets felt really good now even if the fight went really bad I still still think that this part might cost you only two or three resets and that's really not bad at all considering that you're going against Misty with a fire top and overall it's just kind of impressive. Now moving on something that we haven't talked about yet is Charizard has a fairly top tier moveset in Gen 1 as a whole. For the early game I do get access to Dig as well as Body Slam and both of these moves combined with our stats makes us very strong in this mid game coming up. As far as rival number three goes it's very trivial with our new moves and we can just kind of keep it moving on without going into it. With Surge's Raichu having Thunderbolt, this does seem like it could have potential to cause some resets, but access to Dig along with Charizard's very high speed means that this one is a breeze, and from there, we can essentially just cruise on to the mid game. Having Dig also means that Rock Tunnel and these self-destructing rocks will not be a problem, so we can keep it scooching on to Celadon, and from there, I tackle the Rocket Hideout immediately. I do the usual pickups of high money items and as far as Giovanni goes there's not much to say here. I have Dig and the same thing I said about Rock Tunnel more or less just applies here. Instead let's keep the pacing on and let's get to more pressing matters. And when I say pressing matters you might be wondering why I'm picking up here. Uh, I'm just in Erica's gym fighting a regular trainer but you probably know what's going on. Now we've navigated the run to this point perfectly and we haven't had a reset and we haven't had to do much grinding either. This run as of now this run is going much better than expected, but let's enter this Lass, who I guess is cousins with the rapping Lass, East of Cerulean. I breeze through the first part of the battle, but the catastrophe starts when I barely fail to knock out this Weeping Bell, and then I get paralyzed. Now from here, you would think that with 109 health, Rap only doing 3 damage per turn, and the fact that Rap already has subpar accuracy, that she would eventually miss, and I would just win the battle, but I was honestly utterly shocked like slack jawed in disbelief as I sat here for what felt like five minutes watching my entire health bar slowly go down as she never missed and she wrapped me from 100% health down to 0%. Now I don't need to state the obvious here and say how much it felt like the AI cheated but I never would have guessed in my wildest dreams that this would be my first reset of the run and I think it's pretty funny looking back on it. Now what's also funny to me is that I wasn't even going to battle all the trainers in the gym. I was just looking for the trainers that only had one or two Pokemon. So here we are. Reset on the wrapping last. Cool. I make it through and now I guess we can briefly talk about Erica. There's no wrap here. I guess Tangela does have bind but it doesn't matter. Can Tangela doesn't count as a Pokemon. I do get poison but I resist pretty much everything else and there's just not much to say. I do figure it's worth showing that Erica stood no chance while one of her underling trainers actually took me out. Despite Charizard double resisting everything grass and I still honestly can't get over it. Even now after you listen to this, I'm still going to sleep at night thinking about it. It wrapped me from 100% to zero, guys. It never missed. I also learned Slash at the end of the battle, and that gives me a reason to show rival number four. Slash is just a nice supplementary move
move and with this 100% crit chance I can basically murder the mid game and it's on display for this fight. It's clean and it's easy like you always expect with Slash but I just wanted to throw this in here because honestly I just really enjoy Slash when I get access to it. I grab all the money items, I finish up the tower and I grab the final HMs of the run down in Fuchsia and now I can do my big Celadon buy. Now for this run I would probably like to do proteins but it seems probably like overkill due to the fact that we're going to be using Swords Dance later and I end up going with six calciums due to the fact that a familiar problem is going to be waiting for us at the end of the game and shoring up our special will make that a little less painful hopefully. And from there I have a decision. I could dip into Sylph, grab Swords Dance and that would make us much stronger but rival number five is one of the toughest fights left in the game and I decide that if I can take out Koga now I can be higher level for that and I don't have to do something like go into Sylph and backtrack later and waste some precious time that could help us out in the tier list. Now with great stats and access to dig it's not like doing Koga in this order is exactly that hard. It's actually a pretty straightforward fight. I just dig some holes and I get through the battle. I am kind of downplaying this one and acting like it's easy because towards the end of the fight I don't knock out the wheezing in a single hit. It uses self-destruct and I go all the way down to 4 HP but I do survive and honestly guys it wasn't even close. We're still at one reset and we're looking pretty strong at this point. Now I head to seal and there's some high level upgrades here like I alluded to earlier. First up is access to earthquake. I do skip the carbos here because I'm just already going to outspeed everything anyway if you were kind of wondering. And the second thing is swords dance. It needs no introduction. I'm holding off on earthquake because of the dig time saves and I probably should have learned swords dance here but my mindset and my logic behind this is that my experience would probably level me up at a bad time anyway and I do think that Slash has a little bit more mileage left to do and it could put in some more work so let's see if that holds up we can queue up that rival music and we can just dive in first up is Pidgeot and I just immediately forget about Slash but I do crit on Body Slam to nullify my bad decisions and I take it out swiftly before I can take any sand attacks or really any damage at all now Growlithe is Growlithe and Slash takes it out very quickly we can just stop talking about it Execute is next and I'm not 100% on if Ember could one shot it normally but I do just crit here and we can just leave it at that we can always be a mystery Alakazam is next and you already know it's very frail Slash is a guaranteed crit and you know what's gonna happen I'm gonna slice it in half finally at the end it's time for Blastoise Slash once again shines here and since Blastoise's strongest move is Water Gun it really doesn't even do that much damage it's not that much of a threat the victory is all but ensured here and another one of the game's toughest challenges is down and we are still at a single reset from the last at Erica's gym. It 100 to zero me guys, I can't get over it. I'll be skipping over Giovanni number two today and after Sylph, I do finally learn Swords Dance. I replaced Slash and I definitely could have just replaced Ember here since I'll be learning Flamethrower soon anyway, but it doesn't matter. It's just kind of one of those things I noticed when looking back on the footage. Now we can take a look at Sabrina. Now you could argue that hanging onto Slash for this battle would be smart, but here we are. It is what it is. I can't change it now. What do you want me to do? Kadabra is frail enough to where it just doesn't matter because a single body slam can just do the job just fine. And on the Mr. Mime, this is the part where I can set up Swords Dance. Now I decided to go this route because I was kind of worried that without Flamethrower, the Venomoth wouldn't be a one shot and maybe it would like put me to sleep or paralyze me. Does he even have hypnosis? I'm not going to look it up, but it would definitely paralyze me or something. I know. I, I see the look in its eyes. And I also think that the Alakazam might survive a single body slam, but I know that with a few swords dance set up that both of them will go down in a single hit. My damage will be through the roof and it'll be a pretty easy fight. Now with my attack essentially quadrupled, those things are just worries of the past in an alternate timeline and I can just easily outspeed them and one shot them with ease and take yet another badge as we continue just cruising along. From there I take my weekly brisk swim down to Cinnabar. We are on the clock so after doing the absolute bare minimum there's just enough time to squeeze in a little bit of tombstoner brother <laughs> 
and then we can get to Blaine. Honestly, Swords Dance probably isn't even needed for this fight, but I just don't think that Dig would one-shot the Arcanine, and probably not the Rapidash either. I just go ahead and set up to ensure that I don't have to waste any more turns with Dig, and this one is pretty straightforward, pretty simple. The only real thing of note here is that I get that sweet special badge boost. And for anyone new, I'm just gonna go ahead and say the reason that I didn't learn Earthquake yet is because you can save time in multiple spots in the game by digging out after you are done, and Cinnabar is one of those places. Now this is the last time skip of the run, and after this, I do finally replace Dig for Earthquake for the final gym fight. I also get access to the final puzzle piece of our moveset after the Black Belt going towards Giovanni. Now I just love Flamethrower as a move, it's one of my favorite. It's very sad to me that Generation 1 doesn't have a TM for Flamethrower, and it's also very sad that we learned it so late, but as they say, better late than never. As far as Giovanni goes, I can boost myself and I can hit extremely hard with Earthquake, and I do utilize Flamethrower on the very frail Doug Trio. This one is basically skippable, but I would like to take a second to draw attention to the yellow version of Giovanni and the fact that he has a lot more potential to be one of the hardest fights in the game. Now, I haven't played or tested this myself, but I'd imagine if you just manipulated your experience, you would think that Swords Dance plus Earthquake could just outspeed and one-shot anything, and it doesn't matter if the Niddle King and Niddle Queen have Thunder or the Rhydon has Rock Slide because you would just be faster and take it out in one hit, but what do I know? I don't think this will be a problem in yellow, but I could see how it could be maybe. Rival number six is the next obstacle, and with the way rival number five went without Swords Dance, I'm really not that worried about this one. Now Pidgeot is the lead as always, and I want to set up here, but after I take a wing attack for some decent damage, I chicken out at two Swords Dance, and then Flamethrower just doesn't knock it out. It goes for a Wasted Whirlwind, and then I take it out in the next turn. Right on is next, and here I can safely set up my final Swords Dance here, and with that out of the way, my attack is a whopping 500. Now, I do take some damage before I end up taking out the Rhyhorn, but from here, Earthquake is just gonna tear through the rest of his team. Now, Growlithe comes in, it might as well have just stayed in the Pokeball. I'm not even gonna say what happens to it. Execute is next, and this annoying little egg is just chomping at the bit to put a status on me, but we got Flamethrower just for the occasion, and we can move on just like that. As far as the Alakazam goes, I do outspeed it, and that's all you need to know, and you know what's gonna happen when a fully boosted out of its mind Charizard with a 100 base power earthquake hits it, it's dead. Finally up is the Blastoise. This time, it does have Hydro Pump, but even this extremely bulky Blastoise can't withstand our pumped up Lizard as an earthquake takes it out for another one shot, and I clean sweep this battle too. And at this point, this run is about as clean as you can get. The last in Erica's gym was an anomaly, and completely based off of me getting the worst luck possible, so I honestly couldn't be happier with the run up to this point. But my friends, like I say with a lot of my runs, things often go wrong or things just don't go as planned when you finally hit that record button. And since we are sitting at such a great time right now, can Charizard finish strong and claim a top spot? And as usual, I'm going to use all but a couple of my rare candies before we head into the Elite Four, so let's just dive in and see how right or wrong things went, starting with Lorelei. This fight wasn't bad in practice at all, but the thing I didn't account for is that fire doesn't resist ice in Gen 1. What this means is that with the flying typing, that ice is still just full on super effective and I just didn't put two and two together until it was too late. This means that my original plan of just kind of just disregarding the dugong and fully setting up is ruined and I have to pull the trigger early, but by the time I'm on to the next Pokemon, I'm missing about 65% of my health and the cloister comes in. Now thankfully cloister doesn't have great special and with the slight boost to special from the badge boost and the neutral damage of flamethrower we can move on in the fight and things are still slightly under control. Slowbro is next. It only has water gun so it's not much of a threat at all so I can set up the rest of the way and after taking some very minor damage I'm fully set up and we can move on deeper in the fight. That means Jinx comes in, its defense isn't that great and any of my physical moves could one shot it so it's just not much of an issue. Now finally up is Lapras, and this little chunky boy has access to both Hydro Pump and Blizzard, both of which would take my head 
it clean off. I go for flamethrower here, and that was honestly a mistake. My physical moves would have given me a much better chance, but I just didn't think about it. I kind of panicked, and I guess I didn't think that I would one-shot it either way, but I still do some decent damage, but Lapras doesn't miss, and that's the second reset of the run, but it's still not that bad. On the next attempt, things go basically the worst case scenario. I want to do the same strategy by setting up one Swords Dance, and then I take out the Dugong before it can do too much, but Lorelai decides that it's time to crit on the first turn. Now I panic here, and I use Flamethrower once again, but it goes for rest. Now at this point, I make a personal mistake, a blunder. I should have used one Swords Dance, but instead I go for two, and since I can't one-shot it, that means that it's going to wake up and have a turn to finish me off for another reset, and right now this kind of caught me off guard considering that I had no problems in my multiple test runs, but it is what it is. Let's just look ahead. On the third attempt, this fight goes much like the first time and exactly how I kind of planned it out. I take some damage, I use one Swords Dance, and then I'm able to take the Dugong out. I'm at 75 health, but of course, I don't get the range on Flamethrower this time, and Cloyster gets to go for Clamp, and at that point, I'm just kind of too low to survive. And to cut a long story short, on the next attempt, the Dugong used Rest early, I was able to set up more, and I make it to the end healthier while actually using my physical moves to take out the Lapras. Now, like I said, this one wasn't too bad in practice, but this is just kind of how it goes, and at the end of the day, just having a few resets on a tough fight is not too bad. Now, remember guys, for the future, fire doesn't resist ice in Generation 1. That's an important fact. But that means now it's time for Bruno. It's a brief rest after the last tough battle, and here I'm just not taking any prisoners. I don't give any respect to the Onyx having double super effective rock moves and I fully set up and from there I just rip him to shreds and gain back a little bit of my confidence. Now this is the Bruno that we all know and love and we can move on just like that. Agatha is the next battle and it's very nice that Charizard was given Earthquake in its move pool for coverage. I'm fairly certain that just straight Earthquake would be sufficient here but I do roll the dice on turn one. I go for a Swords Dance and it pays off since Gengar guard just uses a dream eater for no reason this allows me to one shot it right after and the last real test of this fight is if Golbat is going to come in and be a nuisance and use haze or confuse me but i get it low enough with a flamethrower to trigger a retroactive potion and i can just finish it off after that now once the Golbat is down and a single sword stance is already set up i'm able to outspeed and one shot the haunter the arbok and the second gengar with a single earthquake and we can just keep it moving on just like that very simple and ladies and gentlemen, it's been a fine run to this point, but you know what's waiting ahead. Don't act like you don't. It's Lance's Gyarados, the biggest menace to society today. Most of my decisions in this run had this specific moment in mind, so let's not delay it any further and let's talk about it for a bit. Now up front, let me say in this first attempt, I forgot to use my two rare candies, so I'm slightly weaker, but from the other runs weak to Gyarados, you know how it's going to go here. Hydro Pump will beat you into submission unless you get a little bit of luck or you just over level by a significant amount. The mindset here is that one Swords Dance puts my damage to two shot levels as well as the added benefit of boosting my special just a little bit so that I can tank that Hydro Pump a little bit more comfortably. And from there I just need to hope I get maybe a Paralysis proc or maybe a Hydro Pump miss and then we can finish it off from there. Now it's not really ideal but in terms of getting the best time it's the best strategy that you can really have. On just the third attempt, you get to see the strategy be successful, but being at fairly low health and the fact that something like Mimic for Ice Beam isn't a strategy in red and blue means that I still have a pretty pretty hard uphill battle after Gary goes down. Now I'm hoping that I get a little bit of luck from the AI so I can set up the rest of my Swords Dance, but a Dragon Rage from the first Dragonair puts me at 38 health, and that means that I'm perfectly in range for a second Dragon Rage from the second Dragonair, and that's another reset. On the next attempt, I once again, I make it past the Gyarados, so you can kind of see that this isn't that bad. This time it misses the initial Hydro Pump, so that means I set up two Swords Dance, and that allows me to one-shot it after that, so let's kind of look at the rest of the fight once again. On the Dragonair, I set up Swords Dance, and once again, it goes for Dragon Rage. Now, do you guys think that this is proof that Charizard is actually a Dragon type, and the AI only goes for Dragon moves? Answer below, comment Comment, please. Now since I'm now fully set up, this means that I don't have to waste a turn on the second Dragonair, and 
I can just take it out immediately, taking us on deeper in the fight. Now this leads us to the next problem in this wonderful fight. I just don't have a great answer for Aerodactyl. My only options here are resisted, and there's no way that I'll one-shot it, so I go for Flamethrower. Even though now, looking back, I'm aware that Body Slam Paralysis proc would have maybe given me a win condition, but what can I say, guys? I'm enticed by Flamethrower. I love the move. Lance actually goes for Bite here, and I'm able to survive and finish it off and see the Dragonite. Now from here, I'm very low. If I can't one-shot it, I got to hope that it uses a non-damaging move on its turn, but predictably, I don't one-shot it, and I don't get that luck. Lance full sends a Hyper Beam to keep my suffering going, and I was so close to the one-shot that this reset actually hurts me. And just to cut a long story short, since we have basically detailed the entire fight at this point, I fell five straight times to just the Gyarados. A run like this is why I love reset sets as a metric. Now it allows you to really define how much a Pokemon struggled or maybe had to rely on one lucky fight and it allows you to quantify it fully to where my old method that just showed the final time means that a run with 40 resets versus a run with one reset would look exactly the same if they had the final the same final time. I think it's interesting and I think as we get deeper into more runs you guys will see how much more accurate that this will make the tier list but that's that's kind of just a tangent and let's briefly talk about the lance attempt after my 13th reset now this time i get the absolute best case scenario for the gyarados fight i swords dance it misses hydro pump i body slam i get the paralysis proc to skip its next turn and i actually make it through at full health now from there i do need to set up two more swords dance and being at full health allows me to feel very safe doing so i get lucky with a miss from hyper beam and then it just uses agility which shatters my theory from earlier that the AI thinks Charizard is a dragon type and actually it was a lizard all along guys I'm sad. Skipping ahead to the Aerodactyl I correct my earlier mistake and I realize that body slam will actually do more damage but like I said earlier it's not going to one shot it either way and I'm healthy enough to get by after taking some very minor damage. Finally I'm ready for some shenanigans like a hyper beam crit but it turns out that the body slam on the last attempt was a range I got a unlucky and it is a one shot and I can finally end this nightmare and we can move on to the champion. And like most runs that really kind of struggle on Lance, the final battle has usually been anticlimactic so let's see if that trend continues with this run. Pidgeot is up first like always and things get pretty dicey fast. I want to set up here but it uses mirror move and it uses the swords dance on itself so it's boosted and this is pretty scary and my thought process here was that if it charges up a sky attack I'll just go ahead and go for the kill and that's exactly what happens here but instead of me one-shotting it I take the full brunt of a boosted sky attack and it does heavy damage it takes me from 200 health all the way down to 83 before I can finally take it out now I do have two boost and that is enough to outspeed and utterly murder the Alakazam so that's always a positive and we can just keep it moving ahead right on is next and I desperately need to finish up my final sword stance. I take a fury attack that doesn't do a lot, but when you're missing 60% of your health, it starts to add up. Now from here, I'm at 62 HP, but thankfully Arcanine is next. And you just kind of already know what's gonna happen here. Earthquake, guys, it's simple. Executor is up next. Its special is beefy, but this is why Flamethrower is here. And it comes in clutch, taking out this annoying little coconut tree before it can stomp on me or put me to sleep. Now I do level up after the fight, but thankfully I'm not using an actual badge boosting move and I get to keep my beefy attack buffs going into the blast toys and I'm gonna need every bit of it right here I have a whopping 657 attack and that means that a super powered earthquake does enough damage to demolish this turtle and it allows us to claim the victory and end the run on a very positive note and that's it Charizard has done it this run was great throughout especially during the badge portion portion part of the game and even though there were some slot falterings in the elite four where 12 of my 13 resets came from i think that this run felt really good charizard felt fluid and the way it handled itself in bad matchups was just a lot of fun without feeling grindy or even gimmicky lance's gyarados is a dark spot on the run but what else do you expect when you're doing a fire type run and with that said i think we can 
kind of talk about the stats for a second. Charizard finishes with a level of 62 with 13 total resets and a wonderful final time of 2 hours, 34 minutes, and 38 seconds. Now, I don't have a tier list for you guys this week because I'm in the process of trying to redo it to make it look better, but this would put it ahead of Polyrath and it would put Charizard at the overall number 2 position. Now, I'll talk about this more in a minute, but guys, are you ready? It's time for everybody's favorite bonus footage. So how did Charizard do on Mewtwo? Not too bad actually. I failed the first attempt, I set up a couple of times, but if I would have just used Earthquake over another Body Slam, I think I would have ended it on the first attempt, but as it stands now I do have to reset. On the next attempt I correct my mistake, I set up and I just go straight Earthquake and I take the battle against the Genetic Freak. And honestly, it was a pretty clean fight, and I'm pretty impressed by it. And now let's get to some final thoughts. Now this was yet another good run, and by this time, you guys are going to see what I was talking about when I said I was in the hyperbolic time chamber for the Parasect race. The runs are just so much better now. War Turtle got really high up, Palkia was actually able to beat Mewtwo's time, Horsey climbed up to number 3 on the pre-evolved position, and as time goes on, we'll just get more runs under our belt, we'll do some streams, and will bring up other runs up to this level and I think it's all gonna work out it's just gonna take some time now do I actually think Charizard is the number two rated Pokemon no I don't think so and I think that out of the top maybe seven I think probably five of the Pokemon behind it could probably beat it but we'll know sooner rather than later now if you guys are curious I did have a full run that I almost made the video on uh, it was a run where I grinded a little bit more but it was a little bit more consistent the time was too hours and 46 minutes but I only had seven resets but I just knew that I could save some time so once again guys it's that age-old question like what do resets mean and compare you know I don't know we don't know the good metrics I know that I like having resets but I don't know how to compare runs like that but I don't want to babble on too long if you made it this far you are a real one and I appreciate you now we got one more run to go before we see the improvements on the layout but I do appreciate the comments that you guys give any kind of critique and that's basically all I have for you guys it was a very fun run and I'll see you guys next time when we take a look at the next fire flying type in generation 1 to see how it stacks up to game freaks teacher pet Pokemon bye